As always, it's good to see each and every one out, especially those visiting with us, as Brother Jeff, or Brother Jeff mentioned uh, earlier. Jeff, you're not alone in folks that might need to fill out a yellow card. Uh, we have had several uh, road-weary folks over the past several weeks, but we're glad everyone is back home and seems to be almost back to normal. I'll never say everything's normal because I know better than that. Again, let me say to those who weren't in class this morning and express my appreciation to all of you for your prayers for the success of Horizons. It comes very fast and it goes by very quickly. And we'll take a month off, the committee will, about a month, and we'll be right back at uh, planning for next year. So just keep Horizons in your prayer as we work and try to influence those uh, young people on campus. Also, uh, was mentioned about those young men that are in the cave. My understanding is that they have rescued four. That was as of last hour. So continue to pray for the success of that rescue effort. And also, a camp that doesn't get mentioned very often from, from us is that it just down the road goes on eight weeks every summer at Mid-South. And they're doing great work at Mid-South also, so remember them in your prayers. Brother, Brother Eddie read for us from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 16 down to verse 23. And Brother John, as you began the lesson, and began the, the, before the lesson, led the song, Blessed Assurance. And that's the focus we want to look at this morning. And particularly, I want to call your attention, really, to verse 22. Where the writer of Hebrews says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. What is he talking about that you and I need to have full assurance in? He's telling us that each and every one of us needs to have this confidence, if you will. And we need to have the confidence in the things in which he has mentioned in verse 16 and following where he speaks about the fact that we need to enter with boldness into that holiest place by the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I need to understand that having this assurance, this true confidence, it is all because of what Jesus did for us. How about the Apostle Paul? We've looked at this verse so many times. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, down through verse 8, what does Paul say? He said, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. And what does he say? He says, I'm ready. I know there is a crown waiting for me. Paul's confident because of the assurance he had through Jesus Christ that his faith would be eternal life. Therefore, earlier in the book of Hebrews in chapter 3, we also can read of that same confidence. And you and I need to hold on to that confidence. And how long do we need to do it? And I'll talk about that tonight. I'm changing my sermon, by the way. Uh, tonight's sermon will be based in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and verse 10. As we talk about our commitment to the God. To God. How long do we need to have this assurance? How long do we need to have this confidence that is spoken of in Scripture? It must be until the very end. All the way until the end of our life. So this morning as we think about this blessed assurance, how is it that we can have full assurance? And I'm just going to be up front and honest with you this morning. You better write facts. I am not going to read all these passages of Scripture. Uh, it's not my job to read to you. My job is to speak to you. So I will encourage you, if you're taking notes, to write down the Scriptures and go back and look at them. But we can have this full assurance. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, the verse that we've already looked at, we can have this full assurance of faith. And when you think about what he means as he speaks of this full assurance of faith, Let's also understand that anything that we do that is done without confidence, that is sin. We need to be bold and confident in all that we do in our life. 
If we don't have trust and, and a loyalty to what we're doing, that confidence, then you and I surely will be ones who fall short. And you think about the Apostle Paul. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look at verse 8 down through 12. And I believe that might ought to be 2 Timothy chapter 1 that we talked about in our class. Paul was not ashamed of what he had gone through. And the reason he wasn't ashamed is because he had the assurance of that which was to come. You and I need to be confident that we have access to our God and to our Father. You see, when you go to John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, in reply to the question, how do we know? We don't know the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Brother, we need to be confident in that statement. We need to understand that it is that truth that Jesus is who He says He was so that we can have full assurance. But as we continue thinking about full assurance, you and I can have a full assurance of understanding. Someone said, wait, Brother Ray, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no way that I can know everything there is to know about Scripture. Technically, you would be correct. Technically, you would probably be correct that you may not have a full knowledge of everything the Scripture says. But you can have a full understanding. And the full understanding is, is that Jesus loved you, that Jesus came for you, that Jesus died for you, and that Jesus was resurrected from the dead so that you might have hope. That is what the understanding is. Everything else in Scripture leads us to that conclusion. And it leads us to the understanding of why people suffered in the ways that they did. When we go back into the Old Testament, we will see that. We will see that the people lived, and yet they had confidence in God. Although many times their lives did not exemplify that. But each and every time when they saw a need, they turned to Him, didn't they? They knew He was there. See, they had an assurance. They had an understanding of who God was. But for us, when we think about that, there is no need for us to doubt. There's no need for us to question what the Bible says. You know, I think of those who claim to be atheists, who deny that God even exists. And they make fun of us because of our faith. Because we have this assurance that Scripture teaches. And sometimes they ask questions. And all they're doing is trying to cause you to have doubt. Well, where did God come from? Well, I don't know where God came from. All I know is the Bible says that in the beginning He was. That's what's important. I don't think it is important to know where He came from. All I know is He was, He is, and He always will be. That's what the Bible says. There's no need to doubt. Or how about this aspect about truly God has given us all that we need, isn't it? All Scripture is given, what? By inspiration of God, that the man of God might be what? Thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We know that God has given us all that pertains to life and to Godliness. God's given us what we need and He's left out what we don't need. Amen. And so you and I know we have it all. And I believe that anyone who will honestly look at God's Word, they can know the will of God. Brother, understanding the Bible is not rocket science. Understanding the Bible is generally common sense. Jesus Himself says in John chapter 8, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And we know that the Bible is the truth that God has revealed to us. But even further in this aspect of having a full assurance, you and I can have a full assurance of that heavenly reward that's spoken of in Hebrews chapter 10. If you and I will live a life of obedience. And we do that if we what? Keep His commandments. Jesus twice, twice in the book of John says, If you love me, Keep my commandments. He also tells us that the commandments are not grievous. The commandments of God are not that which burden you. 
The commandments of God are the things that we should do because we are motivated by our love to reciprocate the love God showed to us. It's a very simple principle. We are obedient because He Himself is obedient. God has obeyed all words He has spoken. For He is one who cannot lie. And you and I go back to our text in Hebrews chapter 10. And as the book, uh, as that chapter comes to a close, notice the writer says in verse 32, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you learned the truth, he says, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so, so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourself in heaven. Therefore, notice what he says, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Brethren, when your confidence wavers, you're throwing your eternal reward away. You're bringing doubt, and you have no assurance of salvation. But you know, I go on, and secondly, this morning, I have to ask myself, how do I gain confidence? How is it that I can gain this confidence to know about that assurance, I guess is the best way to put it. How is it? Well, the very first principle is, draw close to God. Be close to Him. And you, be, be, you become close to Him when you abide in Him. We understand that God helps us. How does He help us? He doesn't help us in a miraculous way, but He helps us when we pray. You see, God, God is always there for us. Remember, He promised, I will never what? Leave you nor forsake you. I know some of you are probably getting tired of hearing me preach that, that statement. But brother, we need to be confident in the fact that He won't ever leave. That it's us who leaves Him. Amen. We know God will help us. And we'll talk about prayer a little bit <coughs> further in a moment. But you know, confidence often comes from within ourselves, we think. But does it really? You know, in this physical life, I, I, I understand sometimes confidence comes from within ourselves. Let me give you an example. Not too long ago, Kay and I went to the store and we bought the little guy a flotation device, a life vest. It has two little things that go on his arm and it has a, a belt that goes around it. He got in the pool for the first time with that on and he didn't want to leave Kay at all. He wanted to be right there because his confidence was in her and her ability to keep him safe. Fast forward to yesterday. Well, actually we could fast forward 10 minutes after he was in the pool that day. He didn't want to have anything to do with anybody that was in the pool. Why? Because he gained confidence in knowing what he had would sustain him and support him. Oh yeah, he still jumps on your back and tries to push you under the water and hold you under. Yes, that's expected. But he is confident in his, his ability. Now, he'll face another test in a few months or next year when that flotation device is taken off. What will he do? He'll have to regain confidence again. You see, confidence is something you work on towards building. We don't need to be like the Pharisee that we read about in Luke chapter 18. Was was he not one who trusted in himself? As he spoke and he went into the innermost parts of, of the temple and what did he, as he prayed. He prayed, Lord, basically, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Is it okay if I paraphrase this prayer? He says, Lord, you're so lucky that I serve you. You ought to be so glad that, that I am on your side. You ought to be so happy that I'm not like that sinner, the, the, the publican that's afar off. I'm so much better than him. He had no confidence. He had no trust in God. 
Everything that he learned was to become trusting in himself. And when you and I began to trust in ourselves, guess what happens? It will be certain failure. When we begin to depend on our own thoughts and our own ways, disaster comes. Why? Because God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts. The Bible says that we, our responsibility is to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And I can go on, and I can go on, about folks who in Scripture, when they began to trust in themselves, failure came. Solomon himself says that pride comes before a fall. Brother, pride is very simply trusting in yourself instead of trusting in God. And when I think about our lives today, when I think about folks who know they need to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ, Far too often, it is their pride that keeps them in the pew instead of walking to the front and asking us to help and to ask God to help them. Failure will come. But then as we move forward in this gaining confidence thought, this confidence gives us the boldness to speak. Mm -hmm. And when I think about boldness, we have examples in Scripture of those who would speak boldly. How about Peter and John? Did they speak boldly before the court? Were they willing to stand up and say, we've got to obey God rather than being brother? And that took some boldness to say, we're going to defy whatever you, the court, says. We're going to listen to what God says. All too times today, though, we have people who won't speak with boldness. Amen. They will speak, well... I'm going to listen to what my parents said. I'm going to listen to what my grandparents said. I'm going to listen to what my great-grandparents said or my aunt and uncle. You fill in the blank. They're not willing to speak boldly and say, I know what you say, but I know better than what God says. And it's more important for me to obey God than to obey you when it comes to salvation. How about Paul? Do you believe Paul spoke boldly? How many times was Paul in prison? How many times was Paul in prison because he spoke boldly and would not back down from preaching the truth? You know, you go on and on in those examples in the book of Acts. And even when he writes in his letters, he speaks to those congregations that he writes to and the individuals he writes to, Paul speaks very boldly. I think of how his bold speech came out in 1 Corinthians when he talked about the brother who was in sin and what needed to be done. Paul spoke boldly against the error that was being taught. But how do we gain confidence? You see, that confidence comes when we trust in God and we will speak His Word. But then next, when I think about gaining in confidence, we gain confidence through our prayer life. We have confidence to ask. Should we be confident in asking God to help us? Should we be ones who would be willing to turn to Him in our time of need? I know it's not up there, but I'm thinking of James chapter 5 and verse 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Our prayers are addressed to God. Those who are faithful, when they will address God on our behalf, and we will address God on our behalf, He will hear and He will answer. You've heard me say it before. I, I don't have to tell you all. I don't have to tell this group of individuals in South Jackson. I don't have to tell you about the power of prayer because you've seen what prayer can do. And you haven't seen it just once or twice. You've seen it over and over and over and over again. I don't even know how many times you've seen it. But we can have confidence and we can build our confidence when we ask God. And let us be confident that when we ask, God will provide and God will answer us. 
You see, too many times when we pray, instead of being confident, when we when someone says, and call, let's, let's use the example of someone coming forward and, and repenting of sin. And they ask for sin, and then someone might ask them later, how do you feel? Do you feel like your life is going to be changed? And I've heard people say, well, I hope so. Or I think so. That's the wrong answer. Your life will be changed. Yes, it will be changed. Why? Because you have God on your side. He hears, He answers. He hears those who pray on your behalf, and He answers them. You see, we're here to help each other as we journey from the earthly land to the heavenly land. But as we come to a close this morning, do you see this morning, I just touched the surface, have I not? Do you see that God has given you and I every reason to be confident? He's given us reasons to be bold in judgment. He's, he's given us that confidence that we can stand before Him and that we can assuredly hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How do I have this confidence? How do I have an example of God this, uh, giving us this reason? Because He sent His only begotten Son, the High Priest, who can sympathize with us, as the book of Hebrews says, that He was tempted in every point like we are. Don't think you're going through something that Jesus didn't go through. Amen. Jesus has gone through it all. Why? So that we can follow in His footsteps. God's greatest desire is that all will come to repentance and none will perish. 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. So when I think about how we close our lesson, and as I look at verse 22 and 23, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. God is faithful. You can be assured that God will give us the reward in eternity when we live for Him in this earthly life. This morning, we may have one here who's not a member of the body of Christ. And through hearing the word preached, you develop faith in that word. You are at the beginning of your assurance, the beginning of your confidence. And you know this morning that you need to make a change in your life. You know that you need to leave the way that you have been living and begin to live the way of God. Repentance. <clears throat> and through that repentance, you are willing to take the steps to come forward <clears throat> and to confess the name of Jesus as the Son of the living God. And after that confession is made, you will be buried in the water of baptism <clears throat> where your sin will be washed away. And as you rise out of the watery grave to begin the new life, from that moment forward, you can have that blessed assurance that comes from the promise of God. Or this morning, maybe you've forgotten about that assurance. And you've allowed your life to fall back into the way of sin, the ways of the world. And this morning, I'm thankful God has a way that you can renew your assurance and renew your confidence. By coming... From where you are, repenting of sin that's in your life, confessing the sin before this assembly and the God of heaven. Let your brethren pray with you, pray for you. Let us help you. <coughs> Let us assist you in that journey. You see, we all need encouragement. We all need help from time to time. Don't let pride get in your way. Ask. Just ask. This morning, what is your need? Only you know. Our prayers, you come to the front, make your need known while we stand and while we sing.